Hey everyone, it's Peter Kurt from Rock Daydream Nation. Today I'm going to talk about a classic hard rock band and is still going strong today. They have just recently released their 25th album, Chaos and Colour, and I'm talking about Uriah Heep. However, I am not going to talk about that album. I'm actually going to go back in time to 1985 and talk about Uriah Heep and the Equator album. So this lineup was fronted by Pete Golby, um, ex Trapeze Fable, had auditioned for Richie Blackmore's Rainbow on vocals. You had Mick Box, who's been there from day one and still in the lineup to this day. You had Trevor Boulder, ex Spiders of Mars, and some of the late 70s uh, Uriah Heap albums on bass. And you had the ever reliable John Sinclair on keyboards and also Lee Kerslake, the wonderful Lee Kerslake on drums. So this came out in 1985, and what was the state of music in 1985? MTV, everything was washed in synthesizers, fair lights, sequences, production was king. You had, uh, you know, that mutt-laying wall of sound. Everything was on an epic scale. Now, Uriah Heep in 1982 put out a bombinog and that sort of turned their fortunes and they were starting to generate a lot of heat in america through mtv and on radio with some of the songs off that album it started to trouble the lower reaches of the top 40 in the us different lineup to this one because he had bob daisley on bass they did a follow-up head first same lineup pete golby etc etc didn't do quite so well bob daisley left boulder came in and they did this album now this album was on the portrait label and i don't know if you can see that the portrait label which is through sony and you would think that being on a major label they would start to get a little bit of heat so there you have this is the first pressing that I got in the day. Wrong. It flopped. It didn't do well at all. Even though they toured off the back of it, I think after uh, touring uh, Australia and New Zealand, Pete Golby had enough. He was a bit frazzled. Um, exhausted, I think, was the, the word he used, and he left the band. And um, Uriah Heep were sort of in a state of flux for a little while until they got the Bernie Shaw lineup and... They've basically been in that um, that sort of lineup with a few variations uh, to this day. But getting back to this album, what's the good parts of this album? Let's talk about the positives. The positives in this lineup is always Pete Golby. Pete Golby's vocals are fantastic. He's got that beautiful soaring tenor voice. And if you look at his history and his discography, he should be on more recorded material. You know, he was in Trapeze. He's done some work with Fable. Um, he should have put more output out there because he's got a wonderful voice that's the perfect cut through for radio. Now, for all the, the, the shortcomings of this album, his vocals soar. He's singing over some, some cheesy stuff like Rockorama, Bad Blood, Lost One Love, Angel, you know, he he sings with conviction, and that's a positive. There are some decent songs on this album. When you strip back the production, we'll talk about that in a moment because it's a very busy album. It's got everything by the kitchen sink. And I must say that the production of this album was done by one Tony Platt. Tony Platt was an assistant engineer to Mutt Lang on Back in Black and I think Foreigner 4. So he's got that Mutt Lang template. So if you think of all uh, the sort of material that Mutt Lang was doing, the bells and whistles and the epic widescreen, well, Tony Platt is of that same cloth. But as I'll tell you in a moment, probably it's not a great thing. So, yeah, there's some decent songs on this album. Night of the Wolf, which is the last song, is a bit of a cracker. It's, you know, a bit of the heap of old. It's got that nice little 
mysterious organ and you can, you know, the guitars are to the fore because that's a big shortcoming of this album. The guitars are paired back. It's all synthesizers. So that's one of the, the you know, one of the truly good songs on this album. Um, if you like your journey songs and if you like the um, sort of power ballads, then um, holding on, lost one love. It's got the the heap vocals, and that's always been one of the strong parts of heap is the the vocals where you've got the the wall of sound and the harmonies, and um, that certainly lifts the material. So on the vocalization side of it, it's really top notch on this album. Now let's talk about the negatives, and unfortunately, these do outweigh the positives. The production on this album is really muddied and it's got way too much happening. And because there is so much happening, some of the the sonics actually bleed. So you can't hear the um, um, sort of separation of instrumentation. And that's a really big negative for a, a mid '80s AOR because let's let's face it, this is a bit of an AOR type of album. So that is a big negative, the production, and it's just too much is happening. Secondly, a lot of the songwriting is pandered to the MTV, and for a middle aged band, and let's face it, they were I think in their forties, coming out of the seventies doing material like um, Schools Burning or um, Party Time, that's it's really D-grade stuff. And incidentally, when they talk about Schools Burning, they spell it as S-K-O-O-L, really cheesy, poor songwriting that's just pandering to that um, younger MTV uh, generation. And it, it sort of missed the mark because you're alienating your old heapsters but you're not really sort of staying in touch with the, what the modern MTV audience or the, the mid-80s uh, MTV audience were, were really looking for. Um, album covers, pretty uninspiring. That's not something I'm going to, I mean, it's like a sketchograph. That's not going to really sort of inspire me to well, I'll pick that up out of the, you know, the uh, Walmart or whatever record store. I must admit, I bought this in the day because I was so sold on Head First and I was so sold on Abominog with that lineup. And I was disappointed because it was just, I was willing it to be a lot better than it was, but it was just, you put the headphones on, it was just so much happening and it was really a bit of a noise bleed. And it's really a case of a band just getting lost in the technology. They really got drowned in the Fairlight synthesizers, and that's um, a little bit sad. What other things can I say about this album? Um, They lost their recording contract. Um, Pete Golby left. Um, They gained, you know, Trevor Boulder. That was good. I mean, his bass playing on this album is quite solid. It bubbles all the way through. And you can still hear Lee Kerslake. Um, Another thing is, I think it's on YouTube, uh, live in Camden, um, live, they still had it. And they play a few songs off this album. And live, it actually transcends the studio version. So that's another tick. So here we are. You've got Equator. It's an album that's sort of, it's an oddity because it doesn't sound, none of the other Heap albums sound anything like it. It didn't do well. So, unfortunately, this was the the last major label recording for Pete Golby and um, he sort of uh, eased his way out of the recording industry, which was sad because, as I said, he's a major talent and out of everything and out of all the shortfalls of this album, it's a uh, testament that his vocal chops are, are the things that lift this album from the totally mediocre. So, in summary, this is an album that's just swamped in technology. The songwriting is not great, but if you if you like Pete Golby's voice and you want to have a few guilty pleasure songs like um, Rockarama, 
then um, it's worth a listen and it may be strictly for fans only. But Heap has a wide and varied catalogue and, um, yeah, this is just part of the journey. And they weren't the only bands in the mid-'80s that were uh, guilty of um, just getting um, seduced by the technology and just um, being a slave to the the synthesizers or the fair light or the production values of the day. <laughs> anyway, there you go. So um, please like and subscribe to Rock Day Dream Nation. Tell me what you think of this album, um, whether you, you agree with me or you don't. And um, I'll do plenty of got plenty of content coming up and um yeah i'll see you soon cheers bye